Good evening and welcome to tonight's Men's Health webinar with Dr. Patricia Heller. Tonight, Dr. Heller will give the Life After Prostate Cancer presentation uh, and will also cover the signs, symptoms, and treatment options for two common side effects of prostate cancer treatment. That includes erectile dysfunction and stress urinary incontinence. You're invited to ask questions anytime during the presentation. Simply click on the chat box at the bottom of your screen type in your question, and Dr. Heller will answer any inquiry you have at the conclusion of the webinar. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Patricia Heller. Thanks so much, Mike. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us all this evening. I want to thank Boston Scientific and SSM for partnering with me to bring you this hopefully informative webinar. It is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month, and I can't think of a better way to get the word out to patients who have been through the unfortunate diagnosis and journey through prostate cancer treatment, but there is a lot we can do to help with the quality of life that these patients have after they've been through treatment and are unfortunately dealing with some of the side effects of very common treatments. Um, so tonight we're gonna talk about erectile dysfunction and um, urinary incontinence after prostate cancer treatment. And we're lucky enough to have tonight along with us a prostate cancer survivor who's going to share a bit about his journey and hopefully uh, shed some light on what it's like to go through procedures to regain some quality of life after prostate cancer treatment. So as Mike said, I'm Dr. Patricia Heller. I'm at St. Clair Hospital in Fenton and I am a urologist specializing in men's health and with a focus on helping men as they go through their journey in prostate cancer treatment from diagnosis to recovery after prostate cancer in their survivorship portion of their journey. I do take care of a lot of men who suffer from erectile dysfunction, um, even without prostate cancer. Unfortunately, some men have some troubles with ED even before they begin their prostate cancer journey. So it can make those symptoms even worse after treatment. Tonight, my goal is to just give you a bit of information about prostate cancer survivorship, the signs and symptoms of some of the most common side effects, um, and talk a little bit about treatment options. Certainly, there's not enough time to dive into great detail on all of these different things, but hopefully I'll give you a good overview of what the options are, because I do find that a lot of men, unfortunately, just don't understand what's available to help them. And so my goal tonight is just to inform you all, answer questions, and also um, give you the opportunity to certainly come and see me if you want to, to talk more in detail about your particular circumstances. So as you can see on this slide, prostate cancer is so, so common. And as I said, September is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. Um, and unfortunately, you know, there are over 3 million men in the United States who are prostate cancer survivors, which is great because we've gotten very good at helping these patients not only survive their cancer, but live full and healthy lives um, as prostate cancer survivors. So um, it is a treatable disease. It's a survivable disease. And it's a disease that you can survive um, with great quality of life. There's no reason um, to suffer in silence with urinary leakage or erectile dysfunction. So let's talk a little bit about, um, first of all, restoring continence. So this is a really interesting topic because it also includes um, leakage of urine during intimacy. And so that's something too that I want to also um, just say a word about, um, even though it's not directly covered in this presentation, that is something that can be treated and certainly not something that anyone needs to suffer with. So if there's leakage of urine during intimacy, uh, that absolutely can be treated successfully. So um, prostate cancer treatments, um, whether it's radiation or prostatectomy, can lend itself to urinary symptoms. And um, what we're talking about here is called stress urinary incontinence. And what that really um, stems from is typically prostatectomy or surgical removal of the prostate gland. Um, and usually um, there's a spectrum of this type of leakage. And so any patient who undergoes this type of treatment should understand that there can be a spectrum of dryness. And so what is dryness? Some patients have a pad in their underwear that's more of like a safety pad that can um, just catch a few drops of urine and all the way to patients having to wear full-on incontinence briefs all the time without any control of their urination. Now, obviously right after surgery, the symptoms are far worse. 
Usually within the first year after surgical treatment, patients will regain some level of continence. But by the time they get to about a year after surgery is when we start to think about, okay, how are you doing? Are you satisfied with your level of dryness? Um, to some people, wearing a pad or two a day really isn't very bothersome. Others are very bothered by that. So it's really unique to the uh, individualized patient circumstances and, and needs. And so I think it's really important to say, no matter what the level of leakage is, if you're not happy with it, certainly it's something that can be treated. So just a quick anatomy um, nod to why this happens. So when the prostate is removed, there are um, nerves that will affect erections, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but also the um, muscle that's used to control urination gets disrupted, and there are varying levels of return of function of that um, sphincter muscle. And so that is why patients, number one, have a variety of levels of leakage, based on their particular surgery, their particular anatomy, um, but also that's why um, there is disruption. So that, that lends itself to cause the leakage of urine, even in the best hands, even in the best surgeon's hands, sometimes this does happen. So it's something that patients should always consider before uh, prostate cancer surgery. So um, again, the fact that this can still happen, even with the best surgeons means that it's something that we may have to contend with after a patient's treated for prostate cancer. So um, just because there's leakage, if there's bothersome leakage, we have options. So what are those options? So it really depends on the severity of leakage. Some men can manage their symptoms with minimally invasive maneuvers that don't require surgery. Some men wear, as I said, shields or pads. Some men wear an externalized catheter, often called a condom catheter because it does kind of look like um, a condom and a patient wears it over the outside of the penis to catch any leakage. Unfortunately, sometimes these can slip and they don't always stay in place. And sometimes it can cause embarrassing leakage. So I know a lot of patients feel very um, embarrassed by this kind of leakage. They avoid doing activities that they would otherwise do, perhaps um, avoid getting out and about with friends or around um, family because they're worried about having a full incontinence episode that can be very embarrassing. Um, many patients that I've taken care of find that once this is treated, they're really back to a better quality of life. We have great um, pelvic floor physical therapists that can help regain function um, for patients and, and coach them in exercises. But again, that only goes so far because again, we've disrupted the anatomy of the patient when a prostatectomy happens. So each patient may find that he has a varying ability to regain continence and it may not be enough for him. So sometimes then we have to talk about um, surgical interventions. And, you know, when we talk about surgery, certainly, yes, um, most insurance companies do cover this. So it is typically a covered benefit. We look at the cost to a patient to um, wear pads and buy incontinence supplies. It's profound. Um, a lot of patients just can't afford this. And they unfortunately um, don't use as many pads as they may want to because cost is an issue. So when we talk about what are the surgical options, as I mentioned earlier, it really does stem from a patient's individual situation, how much leakage is happening. Um, in this situation, um, when we're talking about a sling, this is a procedure that's performed um, through an incision kind of near the um, scrotal skin. Um, and we make an incision there to put a piece of mesh to support the urethra. Now this is for patients with uh, lower volumes of incontinence, maybe a little bit with coughing or sneezing. They typically are dry during the nighttime, can stop and start their urine stream, and also um, have low volume incontinence, maybe a pad or two a day. So this is why we really want patients to sort of go through that year or so of healing after prostate surgery, because this can really be um, a place that they can get to where they only need a little bit of help with this mesh. Now, this is a very safe product um, and it works really well for patients with small volume um, incontinence like I've described. This is a really important thing to discuss with a urologist in terms of what would be the right option for you if you're considering surgery. When I meet patients who have larger volume incontinence, who really are having a harder time using much, much more in terms of volume of pads, they may be um, losing urine in their sleep, um, wetting um, their underwear, their pajamas or bed sheets. 
Um, and this is a patient who I would discuss a artificial urinary sphincter with. So certainly versus the sling that I just showed you in the slide before, this is a more involved device, but excellent in terms of really bringing a man back to a more full level of continence. Both of these devices can certainly help with, as I mentioned, leakage of urine during intimacy. So that's another thing um, that can benefit the patient if they do choose to undergo one of these procedures. This type of cuff um, device is a pump mechanism with a pressure regulating balloon that's under the abdominal musculature that provides pressure to the urethra or the P-tube when the patient is not um, at the restroom. He then uses a small pump in the scrotum to cycle the device and take the pressure off the cuff when he's ready to void. And then he's able to urinate as he normally would. This is a very discreet device under the skin. No one knows that the patient has this. Um, certainly most of my patients are able to go to a public restroom comfortably, able to empty their bladder um, as, as their age match peers do in the restroom and have no concerns about um, being uh, embarrassed about it or having someone notice that they have this device. So it works really well. Um, and again, each individualized patient's anatomy is different. So I'm always um, wanting to take a look at the urethra with a scope procedure in the office before we go down the pathway of this type of device. So there is some um, investigation that a patient as doctor should do in order to determine if this is the right device for him. So here are just a few resources. Um, certainly this um, will be recorded and available to look back on. So if you want to get more information, there are a few resources online um, that you can look at for more information. Certainly um, on my website as well, patriciahellermd.com has some resources too. So let's move on and start a brief discussion about erectile dysfunction. So erectile dysfunction after prostate surgery is pretty common, um, even prostate radiation. So now we're talking about a wider variety of patients in prostate cancer survivorship. Certainly minimally invasive treatments like CyberKnife, brachy seed therapy, external beam radiation are all great modalities for certain types of prostate cancer. So I do know a lot of patients who may have a bit of erectile dysfunction prior to having a prostate um, procedure or, or treatment, radiation or surgery for prostate cancer. And typically after any of these treatments, erections and quality and um, and frequency decline. Um, erections never get better after any kind of prostate cancer treatment, unfortunately. So this is an important thing for a man who's going through prostate cancer treatment to talk to his doctor about um, because erections um, can be difficult to achieve and maintain after this type of procedure. However, there are lots of treatment options. Um, I have lots of patients come to me and say, hey, gosh, I, I survived prostate cancer. What more should I be asking for in my life? I feel so blessed. And I say, well, you know, yes, congratulations. We're really glad that the prostate cancer is treated. Certainly, that's, that's life altering in and of itself. But there's no reason that you should say, well, now my sexual life is over. Um, there are lots of ways we can help with that. So let's talk a little bit about that. When we talk about prostate cancer surgery or prostate radiation too, we want there to be a little bit of healing time before we start to move into very permanent ways of fixing erection problems. However, pills, vacuum devices can certainly be very beneficial to patients in the early process um, after prostate cancer treatment because that can help restore um, length to the penis It can maintain blood flow to the penis, which is all very healthy for, for rehabilitation of erections when it's time. So again, going back to our anatomy picture, as you can see here, there are nerves that wrap around the outside of the prostate. And you know, when a prostate uh, procedure or radiation is being done to control prostate cancer, our main aim is certainly to get the patient well treated for his cancer, make sure that he survives his cancer and is cancer free. So unfortunately, those nerves often are compromised during that surgery or radiation affects those nerves um, during the treatment. And that's why erections are impacted after prostate cancer treatments. So sexual dysfunction after radical prostatectomy is a wide range of patients. And again, it can be varying um, degrees, also depending on the patient's pre-surgical erection function. Um, and about half of men have some decline in function after radiation. So um, it, there are definitely large impacts of these treatments. But again, this isn't something you have to suffer with. We have lots of options. 
So I get a lot of patients asking me questions about these um, newer treatments that are sometimes advertised on television, online, and in other media um, channels, um, shockwave treatments, stem cell, or platelet-rich plasma, or PRP. So while all of these have some exciting and potentially um, game-changing benefits, right now they are in only investigational studies that are in highly controlled trials, mostly at university settings where um, scientific investigations are going on. Um, anything that you would come across in the community, um, treatments are not um, considered anything more than investigational. And I would really um, caution patients about these types of treatments because as um, in my practice, I, I don't think that there's data yet really to support this as mainstream. So you won't hear me talking about these treatments tonight. Maybe if I'm doing a talk like this in five years from now, that will be a different story, but we're not there yet. So when we talk about treatment options, I'm going to give a, a bit of an overview here and not dive into great detail on any one of these really um, in particular, but want to give everyone an idea of what are those options that I'm talking about in terms of restoring sexual function. So obviously pills are very convenient. We have two now that are generic, both Vi Viagra and Cialis are generic drugs that are very affordable and can work very well for patients. They have a few side effects from time to time, but they do work very well. And of course they're very convenient, portable, and men often choose to start at this place. There are certainly lots of patients who respond to these pills, but unfortunately after prostate cancer treatment, the likelihood of that is much lower than in a man who hasn't had a prostate cancer treatment procedure or a radiation. So sometimes men will need additional types of treatments. Um, penile pumps, like we're showing over here on the right, as I mentioned, can be a nice um, treatment option, especially early after surgery to allow for the stretching and relaxing of the penis. And that's a really important thing. A lot of men will discover that their penis has shortened a bit after surgery or after radiation. And that's because the tissues change when the anatomy changes. So after prostate surgery, the anatomy is different um, and the penis can become a little bit more internalized. And it can be really frustrating for men to cope with not only a big surgery, a cancer diagnosis, and now an obvious change in their anatomy. However, with vacuum pumps and regular stretching and, and um, relaxing of the penile tissue, some of that length can be maintained. Um, some patients find this to be uncomfortable, understandably, due to the mechanics of the device, but it can be helpful. There are other modalities, um, including um, urethral suppositories, which I don't find uh, many patients uh, prefer. They aren't very effective and they can be quite painful. Um, so in my practice, I, I very rarely, if ever, prescribe these. However, I do teach patients how to inject medication directly into the penis to achieve an erection, and this can be quite um, helpful as well especially after um, prostate surgery. Um, it's a medication that um, can be made at a local uh, compounding pharmacy. So it's not something that you can get at a regular chain drugstore, um, but a urologist can write a prescription for this um, and use a different mixture of medication based on the uh, particular patient. This is something that um, my staff and I teach patients how to do in the office and um, give them a lot of education on how this goes. So certainly some Patients are a little bit hesitant about injecting their penis with a needle, which is certainly reasonable. Um, however, patients who do choose this modality do find it to be pretty successful. So I do have a lot of patients on this type of treatment therapy. And, you know, obviously some of these things are, have some side effects that may be undesirable and they may not always work. So some patients elect a penile implant. So we'll talk a, a brief bit more about that. So penile implants, a surgical procedure, um, where I make a small opening most of the time just above the penis, um, just kind of on the lower abdomen. Um, and I place this device inside the patient's body. So again, like an artificial urinary sphincter, some patients have both. Some patients have a sling and a penile implant, and some patients just have a penile implant. Um, or just a sling or just a uh, artificial urinary sphincter. So these all can be combined in different ways depending on the patient's needs. This device, as I said, like the others, is completely concealed. No one knows that the patient has this device. It's portable. The patient can have an erection whenever he wants for as long as he wants. Um, they're very um, 
highly rated by patients and their partners in terms of long-term satisfaction. These devices um, last for 10 to 15 years without need for mechanical upgrade or fine tuning. Sometimes we do need to do those things, but it's rare. And patients are usually very pleased with these devices. Um, it brings back um, intimacy in a way that they often thought that they'd never have again. And certainly, I hope Cliff can speak to that personally a little bit tonight as he shares his journey. But I do really think that this can be um, very life-changing for patients and their partners. And as I said, you know, there are lots of people who've been through this. Certainly, it's something that men probably aren't sitting around together in groups talking about their urinary continence or their sexual function perhaps, but it is something that um, can feel very isolating. I have a lot of patients who come back after these types of surgeries really feeling quite transformed because it does really change their confidence. Um, their masculinity feels like it's more returned to them. They have the freedom to go do activities that they might not have done before because of leakage of urine. They can be intimate with their spouse or partner in a way that they never thought they could again. And it really does um, kind of bring them back to a more complete whole state, which is what we want for the patient. Not only are they a prostate cancer survivor, but now they feel like their life is, is back to a new sense of normal. Um, so really, you know, my, my main aim tonight is, as I said in the beginning, to let everyone know what the options are, to reassure you that you're not alone if you're going through this. There are people like me out here who can help you um, and want to educate you on what the treatment options are. Please don't suffer. Please talk to someone and get help if you need it for these types of concerns. So there are lots of different questions and I'm certainly happy to answer at the end um, on some of the questions that are coming in through the chat. Um, lots of patients will ask me about insurance coverage and certainly that's a very complex question um, depending on the patient's insurance plan. In my practice, we always are careful to investigate that thoroughly for a patient to let him know what his out-of-pocket expense could be. But by and large, most insurance companies, including Medicare, do cover these procedures. So that's really great, as they should, to help men in their recovery process. Um, again, why don't all men recover um, erection function or bladder control after surgery? And it really does matter on the individual patient anatomy, the pr treatment procedure that he had, and also how he was doing with urination and erections prior to the treatment. So again, here are just a few more resources. Um, there are lots of things online. Again, um, using validated resources is really important because the internet can be a wild and woolly place where there's a lot of misinformation. So I encourage you to do your research, but find good sources like these uh, to help guide you in the process. And certainly, as I said, I'm always available to help patients and really do feel passionate about helping men through this process. So in summary, erectile dysfunction and urinary incontinence are certainly problems that men do suffer from from time to time after prostate cancer treatment, but please do not suffer. There are lots of options. Um, if it's been a year or longer, um, I've had men come to me a decade later um, and having suffered with these symptoms um, now with so much time on their hands because they don't have to worry about pads, bathroom breaks, looking for a toilet, worrying about um, changes of clothes or, or feeling like they have to stay at home and not engage with others um, or even enter an intimate relationship. So please talk to your partner, talk to a doctor, um, get these things addressed because there's certainly very successful treatment options that can make you a whole lot happier. And I think that's all I have. Um, I think at this point, I'll turn it back over to Mike and maybe he can introduce Cliff. Thank you, Dr. Heller. At this point, I'd like to introduce Cliff Pollock. Pollock. Uh, Cliff will talk you through uh, his own journey with prostate cancer and his um, journey also with erectile dysfunction that followed. Cliff, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my journey started when I was uh, 58 years old and I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Like most people, I had prostate, prostate exams and PSAs for a long time. And every time I went, it was always 3.2. It was fine. Doc said, no problem. I went back once and uh, I got a 6.3 reading. Went for a biopsy and luckily everything was negative. Uh, a year later, went back, 
And unfortunately, it was a 10.6. And I had a new biopsy. And the biopsy came back with one little area that was cancerous. Uh, it's a slow growing cancer, but being the kind of person I am, I decided why take a chance and let it go somewhere else in my body. So I decided to have my prostate removed and had a prostatectomy when I was 58. After the prostatectomy, I did have, like Dr. Heller said, a little incontinence that did go away. However, I did end up with erectile dysfunction. And I will say this, uh, while this is definitely a men's issue, it's really a couple's issue because it involves two people. It's not just yourself. It, it changes the relationship when you have ED. Uh, when I was put on pills, the pills really never worked for me because I got terrible, terrible headaches. Uh, they changed me from one pill to another. And after six months, about eight months, uh, they decided that's not going to work. So we tried the external vacuum pump. Uh, the external vacuum pump worked well. The only problem with it is uh, when you use it, it's very cumbersome. It's not spontaneous. And the other thing is when you use it and you put on the band that holds the erection, holds the, the blood in the penis, the penis becomes cold and blue and actually doesn't look very appetizing <laughs> for intercourse. And it, it feels different. Yes, you can have intercourse, but the feeling is definitely different than normal. Uh, so after about three months of that, uh, didn't know what else was available and went into a major, major depression for two years. Uh, I, I just was laying out there like every other guy, never talking to anybody and saying, well, this is the end of sex for me. Uh, but luckily I got an invitation to a presentation like this and I found out about some of the other treatments. And after viewing the treatments, my wife and I talked about it and decided the best option for us was uh, an inflatable penile prosthesis. When I was 60, I had the prosthetic implanted. Uh, and I will say that it's probably the second best thing I ever did in my life. The first one was marrying my wife 54 years ago, but the implant was basically the second best thing. Why? It returned myself to, I returned to my manhood and it brought back an intimacy between my wife and I that we didn't even know we had lost. Uh, the surgery was very simple. It was about an hour surgery. Recovery was not very bad. Uh, I was able to go back to work after two weeks. After three weeks, I went back to the doctor and he showed me how to use the prosthesis. And after six weeks was told, okay, you can now start to have relations again. Started to have relations again, and uh, I was 18 years old again, even though I was actually 60. Uh, good news is the prosthesis lasted for 14 years, which is terrific. Last September, one year ago, I had the old prosthesis removed and had a new one replaced. So now at 75, I'm on my second version. I have a newer model. It's, it's really souped up. It's really nice. Uh, but some things I'll let you know. In all 14 years, the prosthesis never failed to give me a solid, rigid erection that was perfectly fine for vaginal intercourse. It also, I want to let you know that besides the fact that you can have intercourse again, people ask me, does it feel the same? And I will tell you, it, it feels exactly the same having an orgasm as I had orgasms before the surgery. The only difference was without a prostate, you don't ejaculate. But the feeling of the orgasm is exactly the same. My wife has said to many women that had she not known that I had the implant, she probably wouldn't have guessed there was an implant in me. She knew because we went through it together. 
but she said it was very, very natural. And um, we never had any issues with it. One of the things people ask me is, well, you know, can you go back to working out and stuff like that? The answer is yes. Uh, after six weeks, I went back to the gym, worked out with the guys that I used to work out with and showered with them. And they have absolutely no idea there's anything inside me. The other thing that I want to let people know is it's with you all the time. If you do pills, you have to take them with you. If you do shots, you have to take them with you and keep the material on, <coughs> excuse me, on ice. And that's a problem when you traveling. With the implant, where you go, it goes. And when you go through the airport, people say, well, it must go off. When you go through the machine, the answer is no, it doesn't go off. There's, there's no metal in it. So you don't get embarrassed or anything else. Um, it, people ask, well, what about, does it interfere with your urination or anything having to do with your bladder? The answer is absolutely not. Also, it doesn't interfere with having MRIs or CTs or PET scans or any type of scan. Uh, it's, it's really something that the gentleman or whoever put this together, I don't know, 45 years ago, uh, did a great job. He knew what he was doing. Um, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, and I also will say it truly will do two things. It will bring back your manhood because I know what it's like to have lost it. And it will bring back a relationship with your other uh, that you have lost that you may have thought, uh, well, the intimacy is still there, but there is a difference and it will bring that back. So I, I highly recommend it. And uh, if there's any questions for me afterwards, I'd be more than happy to answer anything with Dr. Heller, no problem at all. So Michael, 